Meanwhile, well, woof. Hey guys, I'm back from my trip. Oh my god, I was only gone for like five days. A few days ago, I got back from a trip to Mississippi, and it was like I was the guy in 28 Days Later. Like, what? I hope everyone is staying safe and indoors while this virus affects us all. I'm no expert, but it's important that we don't panic. Stop taking out the toilet paper, gosh darn it. Anyways, stay safe out there, and make sure the elderly and other people in your community with weak immune systems are isolated and protected. This will pass, just like with everything. Life will just keep on marching on. I had a really, well, unique and kind of fun time in the great state of Mississippi, which I know a few of my subscribers watching are from. And I felt like I might share some of my neat experiences and adventures I had while I was there in a short kind of vlog-esque video. I got a bunch of cool pictures and saw a whole bunch of cool things that gave me cool ideas, so why not share them for those who are interested between larger video projects, because I have a lot more time right now. Alright, without further ado, my trip. Keep in mind, not everything is exactly in chronological order. Our story begins with me and a large group of colleagues deciding to travel across the country to and tour the various cities and towns down the Mississippi River, enjoying blues music and tamales. Despite my carpetbagger accent, I am from the rural south, and I'm no stranger to cow fields, horses, and less than welcome neighbors. I've been shot at before. But make no mistake, Mississippi was an eye-opener to me. Deep in the American South, Mississippi is, according to most statistics, the second poorest state in the U.S., just behind West Virginia and close to Arkansas and New Mexico. And unfortunately, you notice it literally right after you cross the Alabama-Mississippi border. It's crazy. The black, gray, slick roads of Alabama and Georgia and the Carolinas instantly give way to the reddish-brown withered roads with nicks and potholes in them. Our first stop was Clarksdale, nestled in the top northwest corner of the state, a 20-minute drive from the river itself. The thing I didn't realize about Mississippi and much of the south was how spaced out everything is. Everywhere is empty forest or miles upon miles of farm fields of cotton and other crops. It reminded me a lot of my time out west in Colorado or Utah, where there's nothing but desert separating towns for hours. We stayed at the Shacked Up Inn, a hotel of cabins converted from former sharecropping shacks, which was a little yikes. There were spiders and cobwebs and all kinds of things, and it was in the middle of nowhere. But let's just say it had its pros. It's a little odd, at least for an out-of-town guy like me, how everything is set up in towns in Mississippi. There's a big wealth disparity in the communities between natives, mainly black people, but also poor whites too, and people from out of state and out of town, eastern and western coasters. There's tons of abandoned or decaying buildings, and then suddenly you'll see a fancy millennial bookstore or a west coast coffee shop, and you're like, oh, hello there. You just don't really expect to see something like that here, because it probably isn't the thing Old Red, we'll get to him, would be interested in, but who am I to judge or make assumptions? You can really see this odd contrast with the museums in the state. I come from a wealthier state, and my museums are trash, often not renovated or updated since the 1980s. You get T-Rexes dragging their tails and all kinds of things. But Mississippi's museums are beautiful, slick, and high-tech. We got CeeLo Green's outfit from the Grammys, we got a clay skull with human teeth in it, we got Tom's zoot suit, I guess. You know, something for everyone. The Delta Blues Museum, the Grammy Museum, the B.B. King Museum, all great amazing museums with intriguing artifacts and great information devoted to sharing African American and Mississippian history and music. It's just weird because they're these great modern glass buildings with millions invested into them that look like they've been plucked from LA or something, but surrounding them are well, poorer homes, businesses, and kind of crappy roads. 
The truth is, these museums represent an initiative in the early 2000s to bring tourism into the state by heavily investing into Mississippi history. Museums would litter a trail down the state and bring wealth to the several towns in which they resided. Tourists, much like myself, would flock to the state to see these museums and then stick around in town, eat some barbecue at Abe's, or listen to some music at a bar. And unfortunately, however, it appears this initiative didn't exactly work as well as the state would have hoped. When we were at the museums, at all of them in fact, we were the only ones there, and it seemed like it was often that way. Maybe we caught them at a bad day or something, but it was just a little sad to see them so empty and in a state of disuse. For some strange reason, it reminded me of the time I visited a dead mall, the one used in Stranger Things on another road trip. You see this grand and giant building with millions of dollars invested into it, and yet it's empty and vacant, its halls cavernous and, well, dead, like an abandoned Roman temple or something. It's not exactly what you'd expect in a post-apocalypse, but a, let's just say, near-apocalypse. I don't know, I might be looking too deep into it. I've always had an obsession, which I will get to in a second, with abandoned buildings and places. After the museums, we went to the unfortunately named Ground Zero Blues Club, named slightly before 9-11. It's a bar that features live performances from singers. It's co-owned by Morgan Freeman, who is from Mississippi. Uh, we didn't get to see him, though. The singer that night was Deidre the Diva, and she was a lot of fun. An elderly white couple started grinding on one another at one part, and it was kind of awkward, but maybe that's just because I'm single as fuck. I played some pool outside the Wii for the first time, and my team almost won, so that was really cool. After, we went to Red's Bar, which is like Ground Zero, but way more sketch. The ceiling was about to cave in, and it smelled like cigarettes inside, but the performance was cool. There was this old dude watching basketball next to me in an easy chair, and I was like, who is this guy? As it turns out, that was Red himself, just chillin'. A stray cat, I named Storm, followed me and my friends around town for a bit before we decided to turn in. So all in all, a fun night. Day two. So, something you learn well in Mississippi is that there isn't exactly much to do. The second day we stayed in Clarksdale and bubbled around town like bimbos the whole day. I bought a harmonica. We were at some Mexican restaurant when I got the bright idea to say, Hey, I've never seen the Mississippi River before. Let's go see it. You know, because it's we're, we're that close, and that makes kind of sense. So us, a group of four people in total, decided to travel to see the Mississippi River. Totally impromptu, and well, we didn't tell any other people that we were going. And uh, I'm not exactly smart because it was getting dark. We arrived at the small town of Friars Point, Mississippi, population probably under a thousand, oh. around 8 p.m. Once a busy port town along the river, it is now in a state of heavy decay. Little did I know that we were incredibly close to the famous Moon Lake by complete chance. I had crossed the entirety of Mississippi and had ended up, completely unbeknownst to me, at the location of where the largest alligator gar was caught in 1910. Had absolutely no idea. This particular gar, a type of predatory fish, might have been as long as 10 feet, or 3 meters. It might have been as old as 70, or heck, maybe 90 years old, we just don't know. The Mississippi Delta was, and might still be home to, leviathans, truly awe-inspiring creatures. Please support my petition to change the United States symbol from an eagle to an alligator gar, because they are just so much cooler. They straight up look like something that would have coexisted with Spinosaurus or something. When we reached the river, oh gosh, it, it just took my breath away. Never have I ever seen a river that big. The Mississippi River is a lake, man. You can't convince me otherwise. It's ginormous. It ain't the fourth longest river in the world, up there with the Congo, Amazon, and Nile for nothing, I guess. The sun was setting, and it had been raining for days on end. The trees were submerged along the beach, and it was truly beautiful. Just across was Arkansas. And, uh, we'll talk about that. So this next part, listen to me, don't ever do this. So, uh, I'm gonna go off script here. So, the Mississippi-Alabama border, according to Google's Maps, is mostly the Mississippi River itself. Alright, it wasn't me, I swear, 
but let's just say two members of my group saw this area just sort of close to Friars Point on the map where it looks like the border is, goes across the river from Arkansas into Mississippi. Just this little all kind of lip, all right? And, and uh, two members of my group wanted to cross into Arkansas just, for, just to say you were there. And uh, I had sort of a country boy in my group, like an actual country boy. I'm not really a country boy. And uh, he decided to take all these dirt roads to get back there. And uh, it was really dark. It was like 8 p.m., 9 p.m., something like that. And uh, one of the roads had cows on it. And uh, I was recording. But I, I'm trying to be mindful of other people. <laughs> And uh, we stopped the car at one point, and we noticed that the, you know, on the map, it kind of looks like land. It ain't land there, buddy. It's mud and swamp and marshland. We get out of the car, it's pitch black, there's these dirt roads, there's nothing around us. And it's like, it's really scary. It looks like a horror movie set of Texas Chainsaw kind of situation. And we didn't tell anybody where we were going. Uh... We get out, we hear stuff in the swamps, in the distance, like, like really spooky, and uh, that was cool. Thank goodness it was a, a full moon, so we could see more. Uh, there, we, we found the border, okay? <laughs> we took this dirt road, we found the border, it's this like pipeline kind of thing, or fire hydrant. That side on the left there is Arkansas, this on the right is Mississippi. So there we go, we did it. We straddled the, the border. And uh, we are coming back. It's really dark. And uh, something scrambles across the road. And I, I shout, I go, oh shit. And it was a raccoon. It was a little tiny raccoon. I was psyching myself out the whole time we were there. I kept on seeing silhouettes in the dark. I was like, that's man-sized. There's something watching us. I was going paranoid. I was not helping anybody else out. So, we're about to head back, alright, we were very, we were definitely pushing our luck here, um, and the driver in his big Tahoe truck decides to not go back the cow way, because he was afraid that the cows were going to kick at his car and get in the middle of the road, like we had to kind of honk them out of the middle of the road when we came there in the first place, and he was like, let's go this other direction, this other dirt road. And I was like, no, let's not do that. But he was like, let's do do that. And, uh, oh goodness. There was so, we were driving, it was fine. And then we see this big pool in the middle of the road. You, you see that there? And, uh, <laughs> and he was like, oh, I'll just go around that. And we tried to go around that. And, uh, the car got stuck. <laughs> and I mean really stuck. Like, it was, the wheels were completely submerged in the mud, and it, we were trying to, and if you stand, slammed on the, the, the gas, it wouldn't go, it would, the wheels would just spin, and uh, it was deep. <laughs> and I've never had my car stuck before, and I saw it in the movies, you know, when you see like Mad Max, Fury Road, remember that scene? Uh, you'd be able to sort of push it out if you just slam on the, the gas for long enough. It doesn't work like that. It gets deeper and deeper in, and... Uh, the guy, country guy rips off his shirt and decides to push the car back. It ain't working. All of us get out to help. And uh, my phone's low in, running low on battery. We're at probably like 2% right now. It's, it's 9 p.m. It, we're in the middle of nowhere. You can see the glowing orb that is uh, Friars Point, Mississippi in the distance while we're in some field in the middle of nowhere hugging the river. And like occasionally you hear like splashes coming in the water like like a swamp creature uh like a, 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 a swampus or whatever that thing was in future is ramen wild uh and uh we got sticks put them under the wheels kept on pushing you're good you're good go backwards go forwards uh trying to get back on the main road and we just kept on getting stuck and stuck and we were about to call it in we didn't want to tell anybody else that we were stuck because that would be horribly embarrassing um and right when we were about to give up, we get it out of the mud. 
<laughs> and it was good. Oh yeah. Wait a second. Before we got that, let's just say somebody took the the keys out of the ignition and all the lights turned off and they stayed off and we couldn't turn on the ignition for a little bit. So this is what we saw. That was really spooky. We didn't tell anybody we were going here too, as a reminder. So we got out eventually. Thank goodness. All, all of us are covered in mud. I'm covered in mud. All our stuff's ruined. We get back, and of course, the country guy who was driving us, Tahoe man, um, he didn't have much gas, and he was very, very close to E, and we we were running on fumes, man. We got back, thankfully, and I go back to my shacked up in bed, and guess what? I don't have a bed. I have to sleep on this couch that's slightly too big for me. I'm a lanky person. I'm a skeleton, and I'm dangling off that thing. Uh, there was a spider in my sink while I was brushing my teeth. I was done with this, and that was the worst night of my life. <laughs> Happy I could laugh at it, though. Day three. After having the roughest night of my life, it was back to the grind. We headed south to Indianola for the B.B. King Museum and then to Greenwood. We stayed at the Tallahatchie Flats, which was kind of bad. More spiders, more cobwebs. It was raining really, really hard, and when we got back from dinner, my roommate's bed was soaked. We found that the ceiling was leaking and the rain was coming down into our room, which was kind of rough. But again, it had its benefits. We ate at some really small local sushi restaurant. Like, all 20 of us ate there. It was pretty good, but they were, like, really stressed out that we were there. Uh, they had two beta fish in like two separate uh, goldfish bowls, and they they look those suckers look like they've been dead for like months. Um, I tried to recreate the As Falls Wichita, So Falls Wichita Falls album cover. Great album, inspired Steel Ball Run. It just rained and rained, but I saw this little dude. I'm pretty sure he was an American toad, but my pictures aren't too great, so I'm not sure. It was definitely a nice respite from all that negative information. Just knowing somewhere in a pool on a muddy Mississippi road, a toad is just straight chilling in the rain. Again, it reminded me of a time when I was in Tennessee, and I went on this mountaintop, and there was a fiery little salamander in a little pool on the mountaintop, just chilling. And I envied his little life. They fall. I woke up the next morning to find a dog at my door. Two dogs, actually. An adorable black and white male and a tannish brown female. Neither appeared to be spayed or neutered. You know, you can see those things. We asked the groundkeeper if they were his. He told us no. These were two strays that arrived at his place separately around two weeks ago. They were sweet, friendly dogs. I decided to name them black and white male, Oreo, because I'm horribly uncreative, and a friend named the light brown female, Nags. I became instantly fascinated with them, especially nags. The two seemed to have formed a pack of sorts. Without owners, they wandered the countryside, unhindered, in search of food, and maybe even just love and affection from humans. Who knows? They might have even hunted smaller animals and prey, like their undomesticated wolf ancestors. The groundskeeper's chubby little dog would join them on their wanderings from time to time. Oreo was the more friendly of the two. He would come up to you and wag his tail, sleep on furniture, beg for donuts, and just be a sweetheart. I suspect he came from a good home. Nags, on the other hand, was far more of a mystic. I called her the Mississippi Dingo, the leader of the pack, and Spunky. She seemed more feral than Oreo. She was far more standoffish. She would growl and move away from you, especially if you were a boy. She had a soft spot for girls and women. She was covered in a bunch of scars, but I'm not sure if they were from animals or people. But my best guess was that she was abused, possibly by a man, in her past. Wherever they came from, they, Oreo, and Nags now roam the countryside of Greenwood, Mississippi, likely still to this day. I hope they find good homes, though. Quick PSA, please spay or neuter your dogs and cats, and or keep them indoors for the most part. Keeping your pets at home and preventing them from reproducing protects your local environment. Just a quick PSA. In any case, these dogs reflect the many stray and feral domesticated animals, mostly dogs and cats, that populate not only the Delta, but the wilds and not-so-wilds of America itself. Not only animals, like feral hogs and Asian carps, but plants, too. 
Any southerner should be familiar with the green hell that are the kudzu vines. They have consumed our forests and swamps like some kind of creeping cancer. It was a stark reminder of how us humans have radically changed the face of this earth. There's a lot of abandoned buildings from the 1950s and earlier from the days of Jim Crow in Mississippi. I found this one building with trees growing through it. I found it really eerily beautiful. I honestly mean absolutely no offense to Mississippians, but Mississippi invoked the feeling of what the world would look like in the post-apocalypse. Barren fields where bands of wild dogs hunt, buildings being consumed by vines, brick baking under the sun as trees burst from their cracks. All of it almost represented this new age of the world, a post-human world of invasive species and de-domestication. A world longing to go wild once again, returning back to the way it was in prehistory and had been for millions of years. Life after humans. It reminded me of documentaries like that in The Future is Wild. Our modern civilization, and humanity itself, exists for a mere instant in the eyes of the Earth. Perhaps by the year 2346 AD, this will be the fate of our malls, stores, restaurants, and homes. The history of this planet is ever-changing. Animals become extinct, and new ones replace them. An endless game of trading places. With all this talk of the end times, it is doubtful the coronavirus will be the end of our species. But nonetheless, our mortality seems inevitable. One day, we will cease to be as we are. We'll either transition to being something else entirely, or just become extinct like so many other creatures before us. Endings are natural. They are only natural. By 200 million years from now, none of this will matter, and giant land squids will walk around on top of our fossils. It's not something to be sad of or scared of, in my opinion. It's just the nature of, well, nature. Nothing is permanent, and nothing will endure forever. With time, things both decay and heal. The damage done to the environment by humans through things like invasive species will eventually calm and stabilize, leaving a new world with new possibilities. Will house cats evolve to become top predators and hunters? Will rodents evolve to become large grazers and scavengers? Will carp evolve to be massive predators like the gars whose ecosystems they have destroyed? We will never know. We will be long gone and as if we never were. Things pass and life carries on, as it has for millions of years, after us humans. But don't feel sad or worried because just remember that when our bones are dust and our buildings are in ruins, us humans made. The movie Cats 2019. Okay, st hang with me. Think about that. Homo sapiens at one point in time devoted a part of their limited and short existence as a species on this planet to make cats. We could have spent that valuable time, effort, and money on anything else. Literally anything else. And yet, our species spent it on cats. The best thing ever made by human hands. You, viewer, were alive at just the right instant in 13.8 billion years of history to experience this. There are billions of stars in the sky, but there is only one planet, one, that has cats. Likely no species before or after you will have that opportunity. Think about that. There's something oddly inspiring and comforting in that thought. A bunch of monkeys, for a short time, came down from trees, learned how to use fire, and then made a god-awful movie about tiny humanoid felines running around and singing, before they disappeared from the planet forever. It's amazing. Um, where was I? Oh yeah, Mississippi. We also visited a radio station flying the proposed new Mississippi flag, rather than the questionable current one, and I went JoJo posing, and damn, I look good in that crop top. Thank you for having me, Mississippi. I will never forget what you taught me. And thank you for watching my crazy off-the-rails video on my adventure during the apocalypse. I hope to see you guys again for another future installment of Trey the Explainer. Hopefully a little more meaty one. Um, the next video I think might be on the chicken saurus or something else. So I'll see you next time and thank you so much for watching. Stay safe. Louisiana woman, Mississippi man, we get together every time we can. Mississippi River can't keep us apart, there's too much love in this Mississippi heart.